So when we proclaim the name of Jesus, power is released. Welcome to New Dawn Community Church, the message of the week with Pastor Randall Cutter. As we are continuing in our study of the book of Luke, we have an opportunity to see Jesus talking to the disciples about the way that they were going to lead the church. It's interesting because the disciples naturally fell into the patterns of this world as they thought about being leaders. And Jesus clearly told them that if you are leaders in the kingdom of God, there is a different method of leadership than the leadership of the world. In the kingdom of God, which is not synonymous with the church, but it should be or will be before it's all over because the kingdom is like that yeast which is planted in a lump of dough and the lump of dough is the church. That yeast is going to permeate the whole lump. The yeast is the kingdom and it's going to permeate the whole lump of dough, which is the church. So eventually, the whole true church, and you'll understand there's a lot of places that call themselves the church that, isn't, that aren't the church. And how can you tell? Well, if they have positions that are blatantly unbiblical, it's not the church. That's a pretty good sign. If they... Say that the Bible isn't the revealed word of God. Chances are there's not much of the church there. When I was at seminary, we used to study some of the doctrinal books of other denominations. And every denomination, every one of the major denominations, has its liberal branch, its medium type of branch, and then it's conservative or Pharisaic branch, kind of that, if you want to think about it, Pharisees and Sadducees is the, the liberal or anti-supernatural is the Sadducees. Pharisees are the ones that usually elevate their tradition, that's why they're a denomination and they have a particular label, o- over and above what God may be showing today. And that's not necessarily uh, saying that every church or congregation does that, but it's, you know, the, the general tendency. Um, But we would study the ones that were more from the liberal point of view because we wanted to see what was sweeping the church because it's still sweeping the denominational church. And one of them that we studied, a very major denomination in the United States, just simply said the substitutionary atonement is false. Now, if you don't believe in the substitutionary atonement that Jesus gave himself for you, you're just not a Christian. So major denominations that call themselves Christians have as their doctrinal books things that are absolutely anti-Christian. And yet they call themselves the church, the media treats them like the church, and they come out with statements and positions which are not positions that anyone that was truly a Christian would be able to support. But that's what's going on in the world. Remember, Satan's job always is to sow weeds among the wheat. And that is his purpose and his plan. The weeds look like the wheat. They, they call themselves churches. They call themselves Christians, but they're really weeds because they have nothing of Christ about them. And so you have to be aware of that sort of thing. And so Jesus speaking to his disciples is letting us know what the kingdom looks like and The true church is eventually going to look like that. That doesn't mean that it is today. In fact, as we talk about some of the principles which Jesus presents to us, you will recognize that there's a lot of the church that does not have this understanding of leadership in the kingdom of God that Jesus presents today. That doesn't mean that they're not Christian. It just simply means that they're not kingdom-minded yet. But they will get there because Jesus said that they will. And so our goal is to do, our our job isn't to change them really, our job is to make sure that we conform to what it is to walk in the kingdom. But it's a recognition of the fact that you will run into churches that have a kingdom mindset and churches that don't. And a lot of times it doesn't have to do with the denomination, it has to do with the leadership of the church understanding the heart of God or not, whether the leaders are involved in kingdom or not. 
So today we are in Luke chapter 22, verses 24 through 34, and we're talking about reigning in God's kingdom. That's really exercising leadership. I'm using the term reigning because of the fact that we're talking about kingdom, and you reign in a kingdom. But I'm really talking about leadership in the kingdom of God as it's evidenced in the church today. And how we as God's people need to demonstrate it as we are serving the kingdom of God today. The scriptures which I'm about to present are my translations of the Greek, unless it is otherwise noted. And uh, so it's always good for you to have your version of the Bible open to be able to look at the nuances of how the verses are translated. I suspect that there will be one verse today when I put it up that you will want to have your version open in front of you because it's uncomfortable what Jesus says and you'll look at your version and find out it says exactly the same uncomfortable thing. So, okay. (laughs) We are in verse, I actually start with verse 23 to put ourselves back into the context, but we looked at 23 last week. In verse 23, then they began to discuss among themselves who from among them might be the one who was going to do this. Remember, Jesus had just said, one of you is going to betray me. So in addition, a dispute arose among them about who among them was considered the most important. Most of your translations will say the greatest, but that's really the discussion. The greatest is a little bit, we would never say I'm greater than you. We'd maybe say I was more important than you, and that's really the mindset of what they were talking about, who was the most important. Now this happened, this discussion of who was the most important happened in the discussion about who was going to betray Jesus to his death. Now think about this. This had happened before where Jesus would say, I'm going to be crucified. He'd tell the whole thing. He'd say, I'm going to suffer. I'm going to die. I'm going to do all this stuff. And right after that, the disciples would be arguing about which one of them was more important than the other one. It happened again and again. It's like they just didn't get it. I suppose sometimes it came up because they thought, well, if he's gone, who's going to lead this deal? And so they got there, again, they didn't understand how the kingdom really worked, and so they were discussing who is the most important. This was probably naturally a, a flow in the discussion because they started to look at each other going, which one of us would betray him? And then they started to think, well, which one of us is the least likely to betray him? The most important. The one that is closest to him. That's the one that you could expect to be least likely. That's probably how it morphed into that discussion. But it was a well-worn road. In fact, they, before they got to the Passover meal, were arguing on the road. We know that from one of the other Gospels about who was the greatest and the reason or the most important. And the reason for that discussion was obvious. In that culture and in Roman culture, it didn't, under, it didn't matter if you were in Jewish culture or Roman culture, the seating arrangements at the table were all about who was most important. I was at an event recently, uh, just real recently. It was for a celebration for someone who was uh, being sworn in as a police officer this last week. And I had a chance to go to the swearing in too. It was very much fun. But the, uh, um, I, when we were at the celebration, everyone was just milling around. Now it was time to sit down and eat. In our culture, there was really no seating order. That's just, unless there's reserve, reserve spots that the host puts out, it's just a free-for-all at that point in time. You know, if you're going to sit down for a place to sit. It's not as important in our culture. I was watching as the seating started to take place, and it didn't matter. All of a sudden, you just grab seats that were left. Dawn and I, as is usual, were talking with someone to the very last moment, and so we just got the seats that were left, and we ended up sitting by the family. Now, we're good friends with the family, but you understand normally when you sit right next to the family, it's because of the fact that you are closest to them, and that really wasn't true. We're close to them, but not as close as many other people in the room. It's just the way it played out. In that culture, it wouldn't have played out like that at all. In that culture, they, it was a pecking order. Remember, they were seated around a table that was a three-table arrangement and uh, looked like a U if you went from one perspective and, and you know, the servers would be between the three tables that were connected and everyone was on the outside of the tables reclining on a couch and the host sat 
on the left side if you faced into the opening of the tables. And in front of him was the person that would be his attendant. Behind him would be the most important person connected to the host. And then it went around the table from there in descending order. It was a very much regimented way of seating people. And so as they were walking toward the Passover meal, of course they would be having this discussion about who was the most important because they wanted to find out where they were sitting at the table. And they were getting into arguments. No, I need to sit next to him. No, I need to sit next to him. No, I'm the one that should be here. Or no, I'm more important than you. I need to be one seat closer. It's something that, generally speaking, is, doesn't happen as much in our culture. I'm sure there's certain societal... Uh, areas that this happens in our culture, but not, not as much as back then. So they, as they're sitting at the table, it goes right back into that discussion because of what Jesus had said. One of you is going to betray me, and you know the automatic thing would be, well, it must be the least important person here. And because of the way that Jesus was able to dip his hand in the bowl with Judas... As we are told, it would appear that Judas was in the place of honor right next to Jesus. So no one would suspect him. He was the most important. However, the rest of them were all arguing about it because of the fact that it was obvious to them that it wouldn't be one of the most important people there who would do such a dastardly thing. Can you imagine Jesus just dropping that little bomb in the middle of their Passover? It's like, hey, okay, we're having this great time. I'm instituting this new meaning and understanding of Passover, and now I'm just going to pull the pin out of the grenade and throw it into the middle of the table. Say, by the way, one of you is going to betray me. And just leave it out there. The suspicion among themselves, I'm sure they all jumped to the conclusion about who it was, and they were all wrong. Because none of them suspected Judas. They just all thought he was going out when he left to be able to give money to the poor. That's what they thought his heart was. That's how they viewed him. And he was sitting very close to Jesus, which he had to be. They understood that he was one of the most important people in that meeting. So they were arguing all about this most important position because of the fact that that would help them ascertain who was above suspicion. But they, again, were just rehashing what they had already been discussing as they were walking along the road. And that is not, by the way, a kingdom mindset, which is why Jesus has to deal with this thing. But Jesus said to them, The kings of nations act as masters over them, and those who have authority have themselves called benefactors. But you are not to act like them. On the contrary, let the one who is most important among you be like the least important, and the one who leads like one who serves. And so as they are starting to have this discussion about who's the most important, Jesus jumps in again because he had to repeatedly help them understand that the kingdom isn't like the world. Because of the fact that I go to a lot of commission meetings and I am pretty conversant with the people who are involved in the government of Coral Springs, I can see the difference in how the church is supposed to function as kingdom and how the world necessarily functions. When you go to a commission meeting, there's a decorum. The people who are behind the dais are the ones who are in control of the meeting. If you are there as a citizen to speak, you get your three minutes during public comment, and then you're silent for the rest of the meeting. The guys who are in charge are sitting behind the dais. And when you address them, you call them mayor, or you call them vice mayor, or you call them commissioner, And there is a protocol involved because what they say and do has the ability to bind your life. You have to follow what they say. If they increase your taxes, you don't have a choice, do you? You pay those taxes or you lose your house. They have the ability to make laws to enforce codes that would make you have to behave in a certain way. Now, that's not, generally speaking, how the kingdom works. We don't arm wrestle people. By the way, the people that are 
a part of our commission, also have a police department working for them. And they have a code enforcement working for them. Code enforcement's able to fine you if you don't obey particular codes. And the police department's able to arrest you if you don't do what they say. Now, that's the way that the governments of this world work. Jesus is recognizing that and he is pointing out that's not supposed to be how the kingdom works. We do not have a code enforcement in a Christian congregation. We don't have a police department. We don't arm wrestle people or compel them to obey. The kingdom is about letting the Holy Spirit change people's hearts and demonstrating by example how God's kingdom is supposed to work. And that's what Jesus is pointing out to this disciple, the disciples. He talks about the way of nations. I'm just using the city level, but obviously Jesus is talking about King Herod. He's talking about Caesar in Rome. He's talking about the different kingdoms as they were known down through the ages that the people around him, the disciples, knew about. And so the way of nations is you're the, the ones in authority are the masters. They're the One translation says, Lord it over. Over you, And that's not really the best translation of the word. It just simply means they exercise their authority by truly using it, commanding you, making certain that you obey. Because again, they have an enforcement arm. The other thing in that culture, in, in Roman culture especially, is there actually was a title benefactor, like benefactor of the people. And so if you were a ruler, you would automatically make make certain that people understood that you were their benefactor. That's how you kept the people happy. Remember in Rome, if you've ever studied the history of Rome, you, all, you had heard about bread and circus. You keep the people happy by keeping their bellies filled and you make sure that there's enough entertainment around because that keeps the people distracted. They didn't have Netflix. They didn't have DirecTV or any of the things that we have. Uh, Sunday football or sports on any day of the week, honestly, that you can be distracted by. And so they had the, the, the uh, leaders would provide food for the people who were poorer, and they'd provide entertainment for everyone else. And that's where they had the amphitheaters, and they had the contests, which became bloody in a lot of ways, as some of the emperors became even more bloodthirsty as time went on. But they were known as the benefactors. It was the emperor or it was the senators who would provide money to be able to provide this benefit to the people. And then people would automatically start to call them the benefactor of the people. It was all about status because that kept the people happy. People don't want to rebel against a benefactor. If we get rid of the benefactor, we're going to get rid of our bread or of our circus. And so actually, there were defects in the budgets which, city has, which cities had, and they were there purposely so that the benefactors, the wealthy people in culture, could plug those holes. That gave them political advantage and they became the leaders because everyone wanted a benefactor in a position of office even if there was a voice of the people to be able to have the say. And so Jesus is just stating the way things are. They, they're the ones who master, they exercise authority with, the, with force over people and they also are seeking status that gives them influence over people. And Jesus says that's not the way it works in the kingdom of God. The way of God is far different. You're not supposed to act like them. In the kingdom, it's all about being humble and serving. Uh, on the contrary, let the one who is most important among you be like the least important and the one who leads like the one who serves. I translated the word which is, in your versions, it would say the youngest because the youngest was always the least important. And However, that doesn't quite transfer over in our culture um, quite the same way because people have expertise. Right now, if you, um, if you work for a tech company, the youngest actually may have the highest status because all they have to do is be a tech genius. 
So in our culture, it doesn't quite work when you say the youngest. So it's the least important is what Jesus is emphasizing. In that culture where it was always the eldest that received the most honor and the youngest received the least honor, that made sense to everyone. However, for us to understand it, eh, just making it a little bit more clear. So the one who is the most important among you must be like the least important. The one who leads is like the one who serves. And so he's saying, hey, in the kingdom of God, it's different. You serve people. You influence them. You're humble as you are leading them. And then he provides the example which was right in front of their faces. For who is more important, the one reclining at the table or the one who is serving? Isn't it the one who is reclining? But I am among you as one who serves. So this is an illustration from their Passover meal. Remember where Jesus is sitting. He's in the position of the host, of the master of ceremonies, of the one who is in charge. And so that's what he's saying. Hey, who's more important at this table? And he's sitting in the spot. And they'd all said that anyway because he, they called him rabbi, master. They called him teacher. They followed him as his disciples. And so they all knew who was in charge and who was the most important in this particular setting. He said, isn't it the guy that's reclining right here in this position? But I am among you as one who served. That's what Jesus did. He served. And we don't hear about it in the book of Luke, but we do in the book of John. John chapter 13, we're told about what Jesus did as this Passover meal started. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. That was difficult. Here's, this is kingdom, right there. That was the most humble job. The disciples, when they were walking along the road on the way to the Passover meal, got so enamored in this discussion about who was the most important that by the time they got to the room, no one was willing to humble themselves and wash each other's feet. That was the position of the servant. There was no servant who was willing or able to do this for them. Remember, there were Passover meals being celebrated all over Jerusalem. There were little places. This was normal. There was, there was uh, rooms for rent all over Jerusalem for all the pilgrims who were there to be able to have their Passover meals. And there was just not enough servants to go around. They would be unemployed during the rest of the year. And so they had to provide their own servants for the meal, probably very often, and one of the first things servants had to do is when you came in from walking with open sandals from the outside was to make sure everyone's feet didn't stink and that they weren't covered with dust and manure and other unpleasant things. And that none of them were willing to, be, to wash each other's feet was an amazing statement of just how heated the discussion had gotten along the road. By the time they got to the Passover banquet, and Jesus said, what were you talking about along the road? That's what we're told in one of the other Gospels. They are all like, Rrr. they're mad, irritated at each other. No one would humble himself. No one would break the anger and competition that they had to say, okay, I'm the one who's going to do this thing. And so what Jesus did is he got up and he asked, act like the lowest servant. So when he says to them, who's more important, the host or the one who's serving, they would, of course, say the host. And yet he was the one who had served. And he was clearly demonstrating what the kingdom of God is supposed to look like. It's about service. When you have a leadership position in the kingdom of God, it's not about status. It's about service. In fact, if you start to treat it like it's about status, God will make sure that you are taken care of very quickly if you are truly a member of the kingdom because he's going to always correct his people and make sure that his kingdom manifests the way that it's supposed to manifest. He's very good at this. We will see in just a little bit. Okay, we are in verses 28 to 29. He says, yet you are the ones who have remained with me through my trials. I am giving you a kingdom just as my father has given a kingdom to me. So even though Jesus is in a, in a very real way rebuking them, saying, guys, you are messing up with your concept of the kingdom, you need to understand that if you're going to be 
a leader in the kingdom, you got to serve just like I am serving. And then he says to them, but I want to tell you that you've done okay. So even though he has to correct them, he's about to give them a major pat on the back and he's going to tell them about their future. This is an incredible verse that Jesus, in the midst of everything that was going on, discusses with them what they have done right and what's going to be happening in their future. So he's honoring them. You're the ones who have remained with me through my trials. Remember John chapter 6, after the feeding of the 5,000, and Jesus ends up crossing over the lake, and all the crowds follow him, and Jesus starts saying some very hard things. It says most of them that were there left him. And Jesus looks at these guys and says, don't you want to leave too? And their response was, you got the words of eternal life. How can we possibly leave you? There were trials along the way. We only know a few of the trials, honestly, that they went through. When we talk about the disciples being sent out, first the 12 and then the 70, we certainly often miss the fact that some of them were treated rudely, very rudely, and they were driven away from the towns that they were, uh, because no servant is above his master. If they treat me badly, they're going to treat you badly, and they were treated badly. The disciples went out and said, oh, we're on a mission for the Lord, and maybe got beat up, got driven. They tried to throw Jesus off of a cliff, and he had to walk through the disciples. There were trials along the way. There were decisions they had to make every step of the way about whether they were going to continue with this nut job. Because that's what they thought. That's what people thought. He was being rejected left and right. His own town people in Nazareth had said, "You, what are you talking about? You arrogant. And tried to kill him. If you think it was easy following Jesus, when the leaders of your culture are turning their backs on him. The people in the boyhood home are turning their backs on him. If you think it's easy following a leader when he's being rejected, guess again. It was so difficult to continue following Jesus that he takes the time on the Thursday night before he was betrayed to honor his disciples who had remained faithful. Because they had remained faithful, he gave them a major promise. He was honoring their faithfulness, but Jesus says, you know what? The Father's given me a kingdom. And they believed that. That's why they stuck with him. They knew he was the Messiah. They didn't understand almost anything about what that meant. But in their hearts, they knew he was Messiah. And Jesus says, my Father's giving me a kingdom, so guess what? I'm giving you kingdoms too. I'm giving you a kingdom. That's an amazing promise. Jesus is looking at the ones who stayed at his side and he says, I want to honor you. You've done a good job. And so I'm going to give you a kingdom. Now understand, this is the Son of God setting up an eternal throne. If you look in the book of Daniel, chapter 7, you'll see that the, the Son of Man comes before the Ancient of Days. It's the, the scene, you know, when Jesus ascends into heaven, it says he disappears in the clouds in the book of Acts. And if you look at Daniel, chapter 7, you see the other side of the clouds as the Son of Man comes and takes up his throne with the Ancient of Days. And then it says thrones were set in place. And Jesus is saying to his disciples, you'll be in those thrones. They will be the fulfillment of Daniel 7. Psalm 122 also foreshadows the thrones that would be set up in Jerusalem as there is a restoration. By the way, Jesus gives us the same promise through the Apostle Paul. This is a reliable message, namely that if we die with him, we will also live with him. If we stand firm, we will also reign with him. We don't have a promise of those thrones because that was for the 12. But we all have the promise, the opportunity to step into that same place of faithfulness, following him and his leaders in the body of Christ, in the kingdom, and being able to say, hey, 
I'm going to remain faithful no matter what. It's part of the process. And Paul says, we'll reign with him. Again, we don't have the 12 thrones. Those are taken. But we have opportunity in the new heaven and the new earth to reign with him. So Jesus is being very clear. He says, I am giving you a kingdom just as my father has given me a kingdom. That's verse, the verse right before. And then in verse 29. And then verse 30. So that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on throne judging the 12 tribes of Israel. That's, uh, Jesus says, here's, here's the reason why this is important to me. Because I want to have eternal relationship with you. How important was it to Jesus that they remained at his side? He says, I'm giving you the thrones. I'm giving you the kingdom so that you have the ability to dine at my table. You know, if you ever read about King David, you find out that there were times that in his reign, he said to Mephibosheth, you will always eat with my family at my table. And that was a major honor because you had relationship with the king in a very relaxed time. Now, in David's case, it was quite the table because he had quite a lot of family. And probably Saul did too. But what an honor. Jesus says, I'm giving you a kingdom so that you'll always be dining with me. We understand how that works. Jesus had the disciples who were closest to him. They were the ones who dined with him on a regular basis. They were always with him unless he was away from them for a reason or was taking the three of them with him or whatever. Jesus spent time with his disciples and he dined with them. There were a lot more disciples than the 12, but they couldn't all dine with Jesus all the time because there's only so many people that can be close to you. And so Jesus is saying, I am giving you a kingdom so that you have the right to sit at my table so that I can continue to be close to you. How important is relationship to Jesus? How important is faithfulness? You guys have stayed with me through all the trials that we've gone through. You know, we know about the, the temptation in the wilderness, but, and, and Satan left him till an opportune time, and we certainly see the culmination of when Satan was after Jesus, when he was entered into, when, when Satan entered Judas so that he, Jesus would be betrayed. But again, all of the trials that were going on, they stayed faithful through, and Jesus says, that is so important to me. He says, you guys are going to be at my table and you're going to be on the 12 thrones over Israel. Now, as Luke has already told us that Judas or one of them was going to betray him and showed us it was Judas, he doesn't emphasize that there are going to be 12 thrones. He just says, on the thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Matthew says there's 12 thrones. Luke, later on in the book of Acts, points out there's a replacement apostle to be able to sit in one of the thrones. However... In the midst of this discussion, he says, because of the fact that Judas, he just drops the 12 thrones and says, you'll be judging the 12 tribes of Israel. But there will be 12 thrones. And they'll be judging restored Israel. This is, this is uh, one of the clearest statements out of Jesus' mouth that God was not done with physical Israel yet. Because he said, you're going to be judging the 12 tribes. There's going to be a restoration. How can you judge something that doesn't exist? And so this was one of his clearest statements. In Matthew chapter 19, Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth that at the rebirth, when the Son of Man sits upon his glorious throne, you who have followed me, you also will sit upon 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Notice Matthew adds the 12 thrones and not just the thrones. But here's the thing that I want you to see. He says, at the rebirth. What's the rebirth? The Greek word literally means regenesis. Polygenesis. That's really the, what you, it just, poly means again. And genesis. We know what genesis means. It means the beginnings. The re-beginning. And so at the beginning again, 
When the Son of Man comes and he sets up his throne in Jerusalem, we call that the millennium. We're not, you know, there's, there's a whole lot of eschatology that we could talk about with that. However, at the very minimum, the Son of Man is going to come again. We all agree on that. And he is going to set up thrones and he's going to judge for what is known to us as, as the millennium. That will be the regenesis. And there will be 12 thrones as Jesus delegates to the disciples, the reign that he had promised them. Very interesting as we look at that, the rebirth is when all of this was going to take place. Jesus is honoring his disciples as he is working with them. However, at the same time, he wants, you know, they, how would you feel if you were one of the disciples right now? You're at that meal, you've been arguing about who's the most important, and you're probably feeling pretty good because you're going, oh, there's 12 thrones. We don't have to fight over this. There's going to be 12 of us, one of us on each throne wow, this is pretty good. They hadn't worked out the fact that one of them you know, was not going to be able to sit on the throne, but you know, all that. And so they're probably feeling pretty good. And then Jesus has to make sure, he has to kind of pop the bubble. Because you know how we as human beings are. This is easy street from here on in. Uh, not so much. Verses 31 and 32. Simon, Simon, pay close attention. Satan's request to sift all of you like wheat has been granted. But I have prayed for you so that your faith does not falter. And when you have repented, strengthen your brothers. Wow. Yeah, that's uncomfortable, isn't it? Hey, you're all going to sit on thrones, but we've given Satan permission to take you through the ringer. <laughs> Can you imagine their... This is, they couldn't even begin to... They, they couldn't work with this. That's why this, they just could not work with this concept. Uh, Jesus says, hey, he's talking to Peter. And remember, he had given Peter, you know, you're no longer little rock. You're the rock, Peter. You're not that little stone guy, Simon. Um, you're Peter the rock. So now he says, as he's talking to me, he calls him Simon again. Doesn't call him Peter. Calls him Simon, emphasizing his human nature that can get in the way of what God was making him. So he says to Peter, pay close attention. Satan's request to sift all of you like wheat has been granted. That would not sound like really good news, would it? Because Jesus is saying there's a time of trial coming on the disciples. We all know that this was an absolutely true statement. However, it's not one that we would generally think about. Why would God grant Satan's request to sift the disciples? By the way, sifting, that doesn't sound very pleasant, does it? You know, when you sift something, you separate the chaff from the wheat. And Satan, I believe, takes great pleasure in finding out what you're made of. How serious you are about the kingdom of God. How serious you are about God. We've got Satan testing their integrity. Now, his goal isn't to test their integrity. That's why God grants him the right to sift them, because it's going to demonstrate their integrity. However... Satan's trying to break them. We know this from the book of Job. Satan comes before God after we hear all about what a great guy Job is, and he says, yeah, he says, you put a hedge around him. The only reason he serves you is because you're so good to him. If you give him to me, I'll break him. I'll get him to the place that he denies you to your face. And he was making that same accusation against the disciples. In a sense, because Jesus was with the disciples, he was their hedge. He could always step in. But the moment he was taken away, Satan says, give me an opportunity to do the sifting. And I'll show you what's really on the inside of these guys. And Satan could already boast that he had Judas. Let's see how many of the rest of them are faithful. 
At that time frame, before Jesus ascended on high, before Revelation 12 was fulfilled, where Michael and his angels had a war against Satan and his angels, and Satan and his angels lost the war and they were cast down to the earth, before that time, it's very clear that Satan could appear before the throne of God. That's Job chapter 1, and make a request about this sifting. It's not so clear at this particular time that he still has that right. But whether he has the right or not, he will do it. He'll come against you. His pattern has not changed. He will do everything that he can to test your integrity while you are on this earth. His goal isn't to test your integrity. His goal is to break you. Just like he wanted to break these disciples. You'll always have an opportunity to demonstrate what's on the inside of you. That's your life call. We live by faith from first to last. Now, we've got the Holy Spirit in us right now. That's really good. The Holy Spirit has come as the helper, and that, that is certainly a part of the hedge that we have right now as he helps us, as he guides us, as he strengthens us. Jesus says then, he's, he was the helper that was with them. He says, I have prayed for you so that your faith does not falter. Romans 8, the Apostle Paul talks about the fact that we still have Jesus interceding for us. Who would dare bring a guilty verdict against God's people? Christ Jesus, the one who died, and more than that was raised to life. He is also on the right hand of God, and he is always pleading before the throne on our behalf. Isn't that good news? We are being prayed for by Jesus himself in the same way that he pleaded for the disciples. However, in the case of the disciples, they certainly still had the opportunity to be sifted. And that doesn't preclude the need of repentance on their part. Jesus says, I'm praying for you, I've prayed for you, that your faith does not fail. That it does not falter. That it does not become ineffective. And he said, when you've repented, that's what it means. When he turned, it's the same Greek word that we translate repent a lot. And some of your translations just say when you turn back again. Well, it's, it's repent. When you agree that God was right and you were wrong. When you've repented, strengthen your brothers. I've prayed for you that your faith does not falter. That tells us something about faith. What that means is when you have faith, it doesn't mean you don't make huge mistakes. But the difference when you have faith is that you repent and step back into the fight. That was the difference between Judas and Peter, wasn't it? Judas didn't step back into the fight. His faith proved non-existent. Remember back in John 6, Jesus did say one of them was a devil, so he never did have faith. But faith gets back into the fight. Faith is the David who is pleading before the throne of God on behalf of the child that he and Bathsheba had had, hoping that God will have mercy on the child, and he's fasting, not eating for seven days, hoping the child will live, and at the moment that the child dies, he gets up, and he eats, he bathes himself, he eats, and his servants are looking at him going, we thought you'd, you know, it'd be bad if when you found out the child died. And David's words were this. He said, you know, while he was still alive, I thought God might have mercy and I was pleading for my child's life. But now that he is gone, I'll go to him, but he's not coming back. And thus, I am going to just trust God. That's David in action. Stepping in and saying, I have repented. I will take up my duties. I will go forward and bear the consequences of my actions, which he most certainly did. Peter's consequences, he had to live every day of his life remembering what he had done when his faith faltered. But he would come back. 
Then Peter said to him, because Peter still didn't get it, he didn't understand what sifting meant. I, none of us know what sifting means. What sifting means is simply this, Satan's going to look at your weakest spot and go after it with everything he has. Peter said to him, Lord, I am prepared to go with you to prison and to death. But Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crow today before you've denied that you know me three times. You know, you can have all sorts of confident assertions before you step into your trial. I would never do that. Now, again, we've got the Holy Spirit, but, you know, he, we have a little bit more help because Jesus was going to be taken away and the Holy Spirit had not yet been given. And Peter didn't understand how weak he really was. Jesus knew of Peter's weakness. He was well aware of it. And he said, Peter, you don't even understand what's going to happen in the next 12 hours. You're saying you'll follow me to prison and you'll follow me to death? You won't even make it through the night before you've denied knowing me. Because when you're being sifted by Satan, he goes to your core fears. So that God can expose those fears in your life and he can, you can begin to repent of them and say, Lord, I don't want that fear in my life. And when it, you repent of that fear and you lean on God, you're strengthened because God takes that thing away that would have caused you to compromise all the days of your life and now you will no longer compromise. And by the way, Peter did after this follow the path to prison and follow the path to death. The encounter he was about to have with Satan would change him so that when the time came for him to go to prison, he was able to go and sleep soundly even when Herod was going to execute him the next day. And of course, at the end of his life, he was in prison once again and he was willing to walk the path of death. He became willing after the sifting, after the Holy Spirit was given. The way of the kingdom is so different than the way, the ways of this world. In the church, you can go to some churches and find out that the idea or the thing that the church is involved in is, is more looks like the way the world does thing. That the leaders of the church are there and their status is important. And when those people, you know, they actually govern. There was a movement in the church a few years back called the shepherding movement. And it stepped really into a ways of the world type of thing where you were to be under a leader who would basically run your life. As far as I understand the kingdom, um, <clears throat> the Holy Spirit's supposed to help you run your life. Our job, the leaders in the church, the job is to equip and to serve. That's our job. And if we do that, we're doing our job. If we try to tell you how to live your life, we're doing the Holy Spirit's job. And the Holy Spirit usually gets a bit upset about that. Now, we can teach all day long. We can share what the Bible says. And when you're violating Scripture, it is certainly up to the leaders that are in any Christian congregation to say to the individuals in the congregation, this is what the Bible says, and you're in violation of it. If your temptation is to continually rob 7-Elevens, we could update that to Wawa's, <laughs> Cumberland Farms, now that Coral Springs is getting, you know, international, now nationally, you know, chains coming in. But the, uh, we could update that and say, hey, if your temptation is to rob convenience stores, we can point out clearly, hey, don't steal. You're in violation. This is going to cost you as an individual. Number one, when the civil authorities get a hold of you, it's going to be very unpleasant. But number two, you're forfeiting all the blessing and promise that God is giving you by living inappropriately contrary to Scripture. That's what we do. But at that point, we're done. We can say your behavior at this point precludes you from being involved in leadership in a Christian congregation. It precludes you from being someone who can be welcomed at the table of fellowship, the Lord's Supper, 
It precludes you from being a member. Those are the only things that we can do because of the fact that that's, we can't do anything else. All we can do at certain points is realize, hey, there are some behaviors that will infect the entire congregation. A little leaven leavens the whole dump, lump. Use that in a negative way the Apostle Paul talked about when he talked about someone involved in sin that the entire congregation was saying, well, this, we are so open and cosmopolitan that this is okay. Paul says, hey, no, that's a bad idea. This sin will run rampant through your congregation. So protect your congregation congregation from this sort of thing, but that is about all we can do, because it's totally up to the Holy Spirit where someone finds themselves. We're not like the kingdoms you find in the nations. We're about serving. That's what the kingdom looks like. We're about humility. By the way, the kingdom's about power. I find it interesting that in the book of Colossians, the Apostle Paul says, don't let those who are puffed up, basically, tell you all of their visions of angels and those encounters. And that reading that scripture, I've, and this is one I think that as you grow in the kingdom you're probably less likely to talk about the supernatural interventions of God that make you look good. Does that make sense? Because human beings have a tendency to when they hear about supernatural encounters, they have a tendency to ascribe something to the individual and to put them on a higher pedestal. I know of some prophetic folks that have said, please don't put me on a pedestal because if you put me on a pedestal, then God will have to knock me off because there's only one throne. There's only one pedestal in the church that we really need to look at and that's the pedestal which Jesus has. And so as you grow in maturity in the kingdom of God, you actually have a tendency to reflect more away from yourself because you understand what sifting looks like. You understand what it means to walk in humility. And when the Lord says you either humble yourself or I'll humble you, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, and he will exalt you in due time. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. If we're drawing attention to ourselves, that's the definition of pride. And as a result, there might be some sifting in your near future. Important kingdom thoughts today. Jesus presents it to his disciples. One of the most uncomfortable verses, as I said, is, you know, Satan asked for permission to grant, to sift you, and it's been granted. Okay, that's what the Greek word implies very strongly. It's been granted, and of course it happened. I mean, Jesus said, Satan's asked, and he says, now I prayed for you so you wouldn't fall. What does that mean? It was granted to him. Because it's important that all of these things get worked out of our lives. God wants the kingdom to grow, but he wants it to look like the kingdom, his kingdom, not the world's. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this opportunity today to be able to study again how the kingdom is supposed to function. We understand that in the church today, it's a mixed bag. There are churches that understand how kingdom leadership works and there are churches that don't understand that. Lord, we're leaving those churches that don't understand that. And we're not claiming to be a church that understands it totally by any stretch. But we are letting the churches that don't understand it, we're leaving them up to you because that's your job to be able to let the, the, the leaven of the truth of the kingdom infiltrate the whole church. It's not our job, it's your job. And so we honor wherever kingdom is manifesting in every church, because there's always some evidence of it when it is a true church. And we are asking that you would conform us to kingdom understanding and use us. We would like to reign with you, Jesus. 
We would like to see your power at work on the inside of us, conforming us to your will, and we'd like to see your kingdom at work on the outside of us, releasing the power we need to impact people's lives. We ask for your help so that we reign in your kingdom appropriately. I pray in your name, Jesus. Amen. Thank you.